Good morning. My name is Janet Lambert. I'm the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to ARMS Cell and Gene Meeting on the Mesa. As some of you know, this is our first year here in Carlsbad, so I hope your travels were easy and your bed is soft and your Wi-Fi is strong. Um, <laughs> It's uh, exciting for us that we needed to move to this larger venue um, as a result of the demand uh, for attendance at this meeting. And um, we hope that the hotel and the event exceed your expectations. A meeting like this, as you know, takes an army to pull off, and ours is a small but mighty army. So I'd like to start just by recognizing and thanking the events team at ARM, Bethany Cranach, Laura Parsons, Chelsea Hathaway, and Jeanette Lazuski, who are the ones who put this meeting together for us and made it the terrific couple of days it's gonna be. So thanks to the team. <laughs> this is a special meeting for us because it coincides with the 10th anniversary of ARM. Last night, we had a dinner to celebrate ARM's founders, board members, and others who have been instrumental in launching the Alliance and helping it thrive. It was a great evening of kind of fellowship and humor and recognition for those who have got us here, many of whom are here in this room. So thank you for making both this event and this organization possible. What started as a 17-member organization that could have held its annual meeting in the bar down the hall is now the leading global advocate for cell, gene, and tissue community. Our membership has grown 20-fold and now stands at 345 organizations, ranging from small patient advocacy groups to venture-backed gene and cell therapy companies, from research institutions to large cap bio and pharma. This meeting is just one of six major events we hold throughout the year, including our brand new spring meeting on the Mediterranean, which had a terrific launch this April in Barcelona. Our work is now robust in the US and in Europe, where we're actively engaged with regulators, payers, companies, patients, investors, and the media. We are the regenerative medicine community's watering hole and its voice in public policy. BioWorld wrote an article this summer calling ARM the most influential lobbying group in the field. And we are proudly carrying forth this sector's unique promise, point of view, and policy objectives to the US Congress, the administration, the EMA, the WHO, the National Academies, and other forums around the world. Of course, ARMS growth has mirrored the growth of the sector over the last decade, and so we pulled some uh, metrics of that growth. In 2009, ARM was tracking 218 gene therapy, cell therapy, and tissue-based therapeutic developers globally. Now we're tracking four times that number, 956 companies around the world. Total financing for the sector, excluding M&A, was approximately $1.5 billion in 2009, our first year. Last year, sector financings were nine times that amount, $13.6 billion. In 2009, there were approximately 300 clinical trials underway in this sector. Now we're tracking more than 1,000, involving tens of thousands of patients, and almost 100 of those trials are in phase three. Of greatest significance as a sign of our collective progress over the last decade are the products that have reached the market. This is one of our favorite charts because it shows the impact these early products are having on patients. As you can see here, what's so exciting about this is that, as we know, you know, these sort of aren't uh, our father's uh, medicines. The patient response, even in cases where new treatments are third line, patients having exhausted all other 
treatment options. The response rate for, as you can see here, for example, for Kim Raya, is 40 to 60 percent complete response. In more recent therapies, Zolgensma, Zinteglo, for example, you can see that the response rates are 75 percent and 93 percent respectively. What we are doing collectively is remarkable. The next decade will probably make this one seem quaint. The FDA and the EMA expect to be approving 10 to 20 therapies annually by 2025. At ARM, we're tracking 20 plus products that expect to receive approval or file for approval in various geographies in just the next 18 months. And I'd like to show you those. You can see that these products touch a variety of indications, leveraging multiple technologies. At this meeting, you'll hear from many of the sector's trailblazers, including those from the boardroom and the treatment room. We'll be talking about policy challenges, manufacturing barriers, scientific advances, and the commercial less commercialization lessons learned so far. You'll hear about the dynamics in the US, in Europe, in the UK, in Japan, and in China. And you'll hear what's myth and what's reality when it comes to implementing performance-based contracts with payers. Peter Marks of the FDA is here and will give you his perspective on the regulation of the field. Perhaps most importantly, 1,200 of your fellow travelers and fellow leaders are here at this meeting ready to engage on issues specific to each organization and on behalf of the whole sector. More than 80 companies will present their latest developments, so please take advantage of that rich opportunity to get to know new partners and to connect with old friends. What binds us together is our passion for getting a remarkable new generation of safe and effective products to the patients who need them. I've shared some nice statistics, and I'm convinced our future is very bright. But for most of us, what really takes just one person's story to remind us of how important this work is, and what a magical thing it is to be able to restore a person to health and a family to a semblance of a normal life. That's why I'm so thrilled that Emily Whitehead and her dad are able to join us this year They'll be speaking on Friday morning and will no doubt remind us of what's truly important in life and what makes our work special. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the meeting. I have one more job, which is to introduce the chair of our first panel this morning, Matt Patterson is the chairman and CEO of Audentis Therapeutics. He's currently, oh, sorry, I'm messing up the charts. He's not Jacqueline Berry. There we go. Um, he's currently finishing his first year of a two-year term as the chairman of ARM. In this capacity, he has been instrumental in advancing the field and the organization. Matt, take it away. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Janet, for those kind words. My panelists are going to join me on stage. Uh, we're thrilled to kick off the meeting with one of the most important subjects that's on everyone's mind. And it particularly fits into the theme of what Janet was just describing, which is how do we ensure that the promise and potential of the science that we're advancing as an industry uh, reaches patients and that they can be successfully treated 
uh, not just in the United States, not just Europe, but around the world. Patient access. Everything we do is about patient access and ensuring that they can uh, live a better life. And so uh, inherent in that are an important number of challenges. Uh, it's wonderful to celebrate our successes on the scientific and drug development side of recent years, and, and the most recent regulatory approvals are, are thrilling to see, as Janet mentioned. Um, but none of it really matters if patients can't get rapid access to these medicines. So uh, it's important to enjoy uh, that success and have confidence as a result, but it's also important to have a sense of humility about the important challenges still to be solved. And many of those are in the uh, more commercial-oriented arena. And so my panel members and I have put together a series of topics that we think will be interesting and uh, a great way to start the conversation. And I'm thrilled to have such a prestigious group uh, joining me today on the, on the stage. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of them to give a very brief intro, as interesting as your lifetime dissertation would be to the crowd, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to start with brief intros, and, uh, and then we'll kick into the content. So, and I'm going to grab this mic, not because I'm going to sing, but because we need it. Great. Jeff, you want to kick us off? Um, so you can see on the, the slide here uh, my name and, and who I work for. Uh, Bluebird is a company that actually dates back to 1993, um, gene and cell therapy company, both on the severe genetic disease and oncology side. Um, and our lead product, I think one of the things you asked is talk about our lead product. Our lead product is a uh, product called Zintegro. Again, you saw it on slides that Janet put up which is approved now in Europe and hopefully soon uh, to be approved in the United States, um, pending obviously a, a filing there. But we're in the commercial world right now, relevant to your conversation, we're in the commercial world doing the work to get ready for a uh, first patient to hopefully be treated. And that's for beta thalassemia. Hello, oh, um, good morning. I'm Vijay Chirwalu, uh, I'm from Kite, as you can see there. I lead the process development group there, and I've been with the company for more than five years now, uh, pre-IND to all the way through commercial launch. And you also know the product that was uh, presented just a few minutes ago, Yaskara, uh, for uh, DLBCL. And I'm responsible for the process development of all the three different platforms we have, Autologous, uh, New Antigen, as well as the Allogenic program. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Rochelle Jacques. I'm the CEO of Enzavant. And at uh, Enzavant, um, we're developing therapeutics for uh, people who are living with rare and often fatal diseases. Our lead asset uh, is RVT802. And it, um, it's to treat congenital athymia. And uh, I think most folks aren't familiar with congenital athymia. This is where a baby's born without a thymus and it means that they can't develop uh, functioning T cells. So unfortunately, uh, this is a uniformly fatal condition and uh, these children will die uh, before the age of two in most cases. Uh, so there's no therapy uh, for them. RVT802 is targeted for this and it is a tissue-based one-time therapy. And so I appreciate the addition of tissue-based in some of the uh, comments this morning. <laughs> um, we, are, we do have a BLA that has been uh, filed with the FDA, accepted for priority review uh, with a PDUFA of later this year. And are hopeful, uh, hopeful, I don't know if I should jinx it, but uh, if we do uh, have success with the PDUFA, that um, we could be the first RMAT designated product approved by the FDA. Hi, I'm Dave Lennon. I'm the president of Avexis. I, um, at Avexis, we're developing gene therapies for rare genetic conditions with a focus on the neuromuscular and neurology uh, space. We uh, were acquired by Novartis last year and um, therefore a Novartis company. Um, and um, we have our first product approved, Algensma, in May of this year and launched uh, shortly thereafter, uh, treated our first patient back in June. So very excited to be on the market and, and actually serving patients in the US. We expect uh, approvals in other parts of the world later this year. Morning, everybody. Ron Phillip uh, from Spark Therapeutics uh, was uh, involved in the launch of Luxterna. Uh, Spark has uh, a broader platform in ophthalmology, uh, CNS, as well as other liver-based uh, products. So uh, not only uh, is the Luxterna experience uh, relevant for this panel, but we're obviously prepping the market for hemophilia, Pompeii, <coughs> and things like Huntington's, so excited to be here. 
All right, well done. You, uh, you followed the rules, kept it brief. I appreciate that, everyone. And uh, obviously, a wonderful group uh, to have uh, to speak with us today. So uh, now, I'm personally quite passionate about uh, being on panels that uh, are not just interesting, but kind of conversational and uh, you know, are not just sort of the long, boring speeches uh, that we often hear in panels at various conferences. So we're going to try to keep uh, things uh, moving along. We have interesting topics, and, and we're not going to have a scenario where everyone answers every question. Uh, but I've outlined a few, and, and I'll ask my panelists to, uh, to comment here and there. And, uh, and of course, I should say, and perhaps it's better later in the session, if there's a burning question from the audience, of course, we're happy to take those. So I'll come back to that. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, basically the same point that I made in my opening remarks, which is uh, patients and caregivers, um, our most important community that we're trying to reach uh, with these amazing products. So uh, all of you are developing uh, extremely innovative uh, products, some of you in development, some in commercial. Uh, most of you are targeting uh, rare diseases with extremely high medical need. Um, Engaging with these communities over time is, is critical. I'm, you all know that well. I'm sure uh, we would all enjoy hearing a little bit more about how you've done that uh, during uh, development. And in particular, as you've thought about uh, your commercial plan, uh, how have you engaged with those communities to try to give yourself the best chances of success? Uh, things that come to mind for me are you know, education and diagnostic support, your supply and distribution system, et cetera. Uh, so, um, but, uh, but specifically on the patient community side, I'd love to hear a few thoughts. So, Rochelle, I'm going to ask you to kick that one off for us, if that's okay. Sure, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we're starting here. This is uh, absolutely the best place to, to start, and I think this is the topic that gets us all out of bed in the morning. Um, when I think about uh, patients and caregivers, I, I probably have a couple perspectives here. One is, uh, as you know, our, our role in industry, but the other is um, uh, as a caregiver of a child with a serious chronic illness. So, um, you know, I think about every day at work, we're, we're always, you know, loving this complexity, this complex world that we live in with the science and the medicine and the regulation and so on. Um, but as a caregiver, I think, you know, complexity is the last thing that I want, and, and, I, and I think about, you know, as patients and caregivers, you've got enough complexity that our role in industry is really to bring simplicity as much as we can. And, uh, you know, our, our philosophy at Enzavant is to do that by truly understanding the patient journey. I know we throw that um, kind of phrase around a lot, but we're looking at it in the most holistic sense. Um, trying to go deeply, and so for the last three years, in fact, we've been working with congenital athymia families, and because these are babies, you know, we have to think about the entire family and the impact on the whole family. So we've taken a, a lot of time to go uh, deep with the families to truly understand what they're going through, and, and I think, you know, for those of us who have worked in rare diseases for um, you know, a, a number of years, it's easy to kind of jump to conclusions about what patients need and what caregivers need or want. But, um, you know, we always learn something when we listen carefully. And uh, in congenital athymia, one of the things that we, what we found, and we were a bit surprised, um, that the, the worst or the, the most difficult part of the journey is from diagnosis to treatment. And the reason for that is diagnosis comes quickly, which is, which is great in the rare disease space because it's a newborn screening that um, is really finding these kids. But uh, the treatment historically has been, of course, as a part of research. And so there is a question of if and when these children would be treated. And so quite often the families were living in complete isolation, sometimes for a, a year or more while they were waiting to see if their child may be able to get treatment. And, you know, trying to protect against the most simple things like, like a common cold, uh, which could actually kill their child. So it's that time period where they really needed the most support and help. And so, you know, that's just one of the lessons that we learned by listening and uh, have been putting a lot of our resources in um, helping them through that really critical, uh, emotionally difficult uh, period of isolation. So um, I think, you know, for us, it's just a, it's a matter of continuing to listen and uh, continuing to evolve. Jeff, what are your thoughts on the matter? So for, for those that know Bluebird uh, well, this is obviously an incredibly important uh, 
topic, not just for us, but for, for the field. Um, and maybe a couple of thoughts. One, I'm going to focus on one disease that actually was the founding of, of Blue Bird originally, which is adrenal leukodystrophy. And it's a very, very rare <clears throat> disease. It does not have newborn screening. So that is one of the challenges with a lot of these diseases, that newborn screening is, is, is not universal. Uh, making great progress for adrenal leukodystrophy, but it's a devastating disease. And the patient perspective that I'm going to share is uh, a young boy named Ethan who is all over the company. His uh, skateboard poem is in the lobby of the company right now. So everybody that walks into the company and sits around the table sees his poem about uh, skateboarding. It was a passion of his. Um, but staying connected not just to Ethan's story, but the parents' story, both during the process and then post-process. Unfortunately, Ethan didn't survive his disease of ALD. And it brought to light, when you talk to the parents and the trials and tribulations that they went through over a period of years, um, the things that the system is missing. So first of all, there's a systemic um, aspect to this that isn't any, anything related to gene or cell therapy or tissue therapy that we have to be a part of as a community. Um, so it can't just be about our products. It has to be about supporting these patients more uh, broadly than that. And so newborn screening is something we've gotten very, very in, involved in as much as you, uh, a company can, but supporting it because it's just the right thing to do. Um, and then obviously you learn about their experiences, um, emotional experiences as much as the practical experiences of getting access to care that, that we also need to support. And in there, you know, really need to understand the cell and gene therapy part of that, especially with an autologous product where you know, the phrase is the, the patient is the process, the process is the patient. And in that case, you, you really need to understand that journey, as you were just describing before, in detail, in depth, and understand the emotional points of those patients so you can support them throughout that process. Um, it's a hard thing to go through with a transplant, hard thing, thing to go through with a diagnosis of a potentially lethal disease. And so that commitment has to be there from the second you in, engage in uh, the research side of things to go after um, a hopefully a cure, at least a, a profound uh, a treatment with profound impact. So it, it has to be broad. It can't just be about your therapeutic, in my opinion. That's the way you get the community to engage as well, in a way that's productive and useful for, for, for everybody to make sure that um, the product ultimately meets the needs of, of the patients and the caregivers and everybody that surrounds him or her. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Dave, you're on the market uh, in the SMA community, and sometimes um, things come up that are a little bit uh, surprising or different. I guess I'd be curious to hear if anything unique or interesting that's come up that surprised you in your experience yeah. working with the patient community in particular. Working with the patient community. Yeah, so, it, so <laughs> every week, but I'll focus on the patient community right now. The, um, Just to be clear. <laughs> yes, patients. got it. The, um, uh, listen, I think we all, I mean, these are, uh, often we're dealing with babies. So we're, the, frankly, the folks we're talking to are young families um, that are challenged with something they didn't imagine happening to them. And they're quite isolated often in their community because these are rare diseases and there won't be other folks local to them who might have this condition. So the social media has always been an outlet for folks to connect in these communities and form networks that are regional, national, global in nature um, in terms of sharing information. I think the surprising thing for us has been how the tools of social media have now started to be applied to actually getting things done within uh, treatment of rare diseases. And so what we're seeing is really decision making from parents happening within those social networks. We're seeing folks uh, tweet and Facebook post their first infusion. Um, we had a case where we were treating kids before launch uh, through a managed access program the second patient we treated uh, posted on Facebook a picture of the, the infusion bag with the, the drug on it and their child. We had 18 requests that week then for further access uh, to the medication. We've had cases now, we've had at least a dozen cases outside of the US where people are using social funding or crowdfunding to raise millions of dollars to get access to treatment of Solgensmet, many of them successfully and many of them treated through that mechanism. Um, so we're in a different world in terms of the ability of the community to contribute um, to the care of these children and the ability of parents to activate the network uh, to get decisions made, to get funding, um, to get reversals. In the US, we're seeing reversals of uh, denials of therapy driven by Twitter armies who go after Medicaid 
medical directors. So we have these amazing you know, new things that are happening and new uses of how social media is not just information sharing anymore for the families. It's actually a tool for how they're going to gain treatment and gain access and gain influence in the system. Great, thanks. Uh, let's move on to another topic. Uh, this one I, I, top, I titled uh, Centers of Excellence or Sites of Care. Um, each of your products or many of your products require special handling, special circumstances for uh, patient administration. And those of you that have come to market um, have, I think, outlined a plan to at least start with a select number of centers to manage that process as effectively as possible. So, uh, Ron, I'm thinking of you in particular. Spark was uh, clear about taking that sort of approach initially um, with Luxterna. And so I'd love to hear more about um, you know, how eager and willing those sites were to be involved, sort of how you managed through that process, and, and, um, and what key barriers maybe you, you faced when you were trying to get centers up and going initially. Sure. Um, in terms of eagerness, everybody was pretty eager. I think, uh, I think everybody understands the, the moment and what this modality brings to the table. I think especially the clinical medical side in most of these centers are very eager to get their hands on it and obviously utilize it within those centers. Uh, to be able to help patients. So I think uh, we had a tremendous amount of outreach from a variety of different centers uh, that wanted to be part of the program. I think the, 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 the challenge that we had to balance was, you know, there's a lot of vitroretinal uh, surgeons that knew how to do the actual procedure, and there's a ton of them around the country, but there weren't that many inherited retinal disease specialists. And we felt like we needed the sur surgical aspect as well as the IRD, the genetic uh, training and background to be able to take care of these patients because we weren't going to be able to set, set that up in every state or every city. And so we were pretty conscious about picking uh, centers that had that balance and what were able to also facilitate the patient services uh, uh, elements that we needed in place, especially talking about bringing patients from California to Wisconsin or whatever it may have been. There's a variety of things that will show up. And so because of that dynamic, and, and, and another important aspect is that this is an ultra rare disease, there's probably one to 2,000 of these patients, so even if we set up 100 centers, there just wasn't going to be enough volume to be able to keep all of those centers uh, uh, you know, com completely satiated. So for us, it was a pretty clear decision that we needed to have a more narrow distribution, and therefore we ended up going with uh, 10 centers. And you know, one of the benefits of going with a narrow distribution is that some of the initial uh, barriers can be easily addressed. There's a lot of unknowns around you know, cell and gene therapy, and a lot of the centers weren't really equipped. So, but you could focus. We had a limited set of resources, but we could actually use those resources to focus on those centers to get them up to speed, to get them comfortable. And you have to go through it a few times. You need live examples. All the practice in the world doesn't prepare you for you know, having the product delivered to the wrong shipping dock and going to the wrong pharmacy and not having the right preparation. So we were able to get that done in a concentrated uh, manner. And those, uh, those, I guess, initial barriers were quickly uh, addressed. I think the, the converse of that is that you get some longer term barriers. And we're still working through that. Because we have a limited distribution, you end up having a variety of different scenarios that show up from patient to patient. Uh, you have home host uh, scenarios that come up with Blue Cross Blue Shield. You have, uh, again, uh, out-of-state Medicaid, which is not the easiest thing to facilitate. In-state Medicaid, let alone as challenging, trying to credential doctors uh, from Tennessee, or I'm sorry, in Pennsylvania for a Tennessee Medicaid is not the, the most trivial of, of processes. So the trade-off that you immediately get is you got the centers up and running, but you've got these payer complexities uh, that you're going to have to manage, and you're going to have to manage them one at a time. Because, again, the prevalence is low, so the number of patients that come up is going to have a variety of different uh, scenarios, whether that's commercial, government, et cetera, and you just have to work with the centers to be able to address those things. And really, our challenge has been to really you know, uh, uh, compress the timeline in terms of getting a patient from diagnosis to treatment. We're improving every day, and obviously, over the course of time, it's going to get more and more compressed. But that's been our primary focus. <clears throat> Jeff, congratulations on the beta thal approval for Europe. Um, you guys are busy getting ready to bring that to market, and uh, fingers crossed for the U.S. in short order, but um, also a subject of great importance for you all, and in particular in the uh, 
combination of gene and cell therapy mm -hmm. uh, space. So maybe you could speak to Bluebird's experience, and, and if there's a way to layer in a European angle, that's great, but it may be overarching, but I'd love to hear more about how you guys are thinking yeah, about it. I think it. a lot of the learnings um, in Europe are going to be uh, transferable to, to the U.S. There are some peculiarities for sure, in particular on the payer side, but we're, if we're talking about QTCs separately, um, one thing, and I think everybody knows for a therapy like this, um, it's autologous, it's cell therapy, so it starts obviously with enrollment, but then the patient has to have his or her cells collected. So that is the, ultimately becomes the, the drug product that gets infused back in the patient. So it's a more complex process uh, when you're talking about aut autologous because the patient has to come in, collect cells, patient goes away, cells get processed, released, patient comes back in, goes for a transplant um, of the cells that were gene modified. And so with that, associated with a um, uh, qualified treatment center, so we're called, we call them qualified treatment centers for a reason, it, it becomes a, a, a pretty complex process that uh, the QTCs have to um, ultimately navigate and we have to be there supporting them the whole way through that process. So it's been a, a crazy amount of education and learning. The learning continues to this day. Um, we'll continue for quite some time as you experience these one-offs um, that you couldn't, make, couldn't have anticipated. And we're not quite there yet, but we're already learning as we've, um, we've engaged these qualified treatment centers, not just across Germany where we would expect to have the per first patient, but also now in um, Italy and in France um, and in the UK. And they bring certain differences, but there's a lot of commonalities. And I actually wrote down anticipating this question, I don't know how I knew the question was gonna come, but um, uh, a, a few of the... Um, I, I'm not sure, I that seemed either. like an insult. But, uh. <laughs> a, a few of the, the things, the categories of things that we've, we're continuing to learn on and educate ourselves on and, and work with these qualified treatment centers. Uh, identification is the first one, it's the patients, the disease and the experience that they have. The second is qualifying the centers themselves they have to be transplant accredited. They have to have the skills and capabilities to be able to process a patient from start to finish. Um, process alignment, so everything from all of the IT systems that need to be put in there to track the patients at the site to data protection um, to the logistics of it. You reference logistics. That's a pretty significant part that yeah. you certainly can't screw up. Right. Um, obviously, the, the one that suffers there is not us. It's not the centers. It's the patient. So, um, training. The, all the systems and interfaces, the enrollment scheduling, the ordering, the storing, the handling, and the fusing, the fusing of, the, of the therapy back to the patient, and then the contracting, um, quality, registry, contracting, and commercial. So all of those things have to come together over a relative short period of time um, from approval to having that first QTC up and running. And, and I, I just scratched the surface here on all the things that, that have to be in place to get that first patient through the process. Um, if you're a small molecule company, obviously this is just so incredibly foreign. And uh, it's even foreign to the industry, quite frankly, right now. We're still learning, and we still will continue to learn throughout that. And I think we need to leverage each other in this process um, to get it right. One real quick anecdote was um, related to printers. You run into this, this issue of if you've got CAR-Ts going into uh, uh, a transplant center, they want their own printer. They want their own system in there because it's specific to, to that CAR-T. You get a gene therapy product, we want our own printers. We want our own systems because we think ours are the best. Ultimately, that can't persist when you've got two, three, four, five, ten, 10, hopefully 100 products out there. There has to be a convergence of um, these type of systems. And that's a challenge for us as a, as a field. And some of the things that actually ARM is working on ultimately can, can help uh, with that type of convergence of these type of systems. And there's lots of other little anecdotes there that, uh, that, that suggest we still have a lot, a, lot of, a lot of learning and a ways to go. But um, Well, and that last point is an important one that you know, I should have said in the opening remarks is uh, you, it says trailblazers, pioneers, whatever you want to say, right? Uh, several of the companies that are up here are uh, trying to execute in a system globally that really isn't designed for this type of product, whether it's for payment or operational issues. So uh, it's a tremendous amount of complexity and, and we're all uh, learning fast from the efforts of, uh, of all your companies, so we appreciate that. Uh, speaking of payment, let's turn a bit to the subject of uh, payers and reimbursement authorities. Uh, so there's a group of 
uh, folks, uh, different parties that uh, are involved in that conversation directly or indirectly, and uh, each of your companies, uh, well, some more than others at this stage, um, have spent a lot of time working with these folks. And it would be helpful to understand sort of uh, your perceptions and suggestions of how to engage with uh, the various constituents in the conversation leading to pricing and reimbursement. So whether it's a private payer or a health authority or, importantly, organizations like NICE or ICER, who obviously play an important uh, and high-profile role in the conversation around pricing today. Um, so I think maybe, Dave, I'm going to ask you to tackle that one first. You're welcome. Sure. Um, <laughs> and then we can uh, ask for a couple yeah, others so to speak to it as well. But mostly about yeah, how do you engage with those folks? How do you embrace the conversation and sort of when maybe and, and uh, impressions of how that process has gone and gotten you to where you are today? Sure. Um, I mean, listen, so we, we started this, this journey very early. And um, we knew from the outset that we believed we had the most valuable medication that may ever be launched because it took kids who would otherwise die and gave them a whole life. And that is a transformational benefit for patients, for their families, for everyone. Um, but we also knew that when you look at it from a health economic point of view, it creates, creates tremendous value in the system. And so we knew we had the most, one of the most valuable medications um, ever in development. So the question was then how do you um, get recognized for that value and therefore then price the product appropriately? And I think um, you know, a couple things I think we did well in terms of that was starting the, that engagement very early and starting with a discussion of what is the total value? How do you ascribe value to this kind of product that gives lifetime of, of um, potential benefit that you know, transforms you know, from death to life at a very early age? And, and how can we think about the offsets that occur within that system? How do we think about the, the value that can be ascribed to the product? And I think part of it was making sure we had the experts internally who could really have that conversation. From a very early point in time, we had engaged folks and had people working for us who had deep knowledge, deep partnership, deep understanding of what, how payers like NICE, like ICER, like insurance companies would respond to this kind of discussion. Um, and so we engaged um, in that. We built all the models before we started having discussions. So we knew what their own evaluations would show for this potential product. And we went about that to then have those discussions and, and have a first discussion of do we agree on the value? Do we agree on how we should share value uh, in the system? And I think no payer is going to get up and say, yeah, we love the fact that you priced the product at a multi $2.1 million and broke the seven-figure barrier for, for us. Um, but at the end of the day, when we have the discussion of will you cover it at that price, they're very happy. Happy is a strong word. They're, they're, they agree <laughs> to do so. <laughs> they, they agree to do so um, because they understand the value that it, that it provides. Um, we engaged with ICER very early in that discussion. You know, we were evaluated before we were approved um, in terms of the value we provided. And, and ultimately, at launch, we were able to get you know, a a generally neutral statement that the product was value for money at, at the launch price that we, we went for. And we've seen that in the marketplace so far. Um, we've said you know, publicly before that we, we've no, seen no real denials for an on-label patient uh, in the market so far. Um, and I think it speaks to the success that the team <coughs> brought forward to, to make that happen and, and the reality of what the product uh, can do and being realistic about what the product can do. That's uh, interesting to hear, given that if all we did was pay attention to some of the headlines in the media, you would think that patients were really struggling to get payment and access. So I'm glad to hear it and uh, appreciate that perspective. Ron, you guys have been very busy uh, in these ways over the years as well, and, and so I'd love to hear your take on, on sort of the same, same issue of how you engaged and tried to work through those conversations. and, and uh, I guess, and interested if there's any, you think there's big misconceptions in the community uh, about how that process goes? Yeah, I mean, for us, we were kind of facing kind of three unique challenges. You know, Spark was kind of just starting out. We weren't a commercial company, so really the payer community didn't know us at that time. They also didn't know Gene Therapies. It was the first one uh, in the U.S. market. And the last one, not to make things easy, was that they really didn't have any exposure to uh, inherited retinal disease and solutions for that. So we were conscious that there was some big lifting that needed to be done. So we used, obviously, uh, the benefits of the 21st Century's Cures Act to be able to go early 
uh, to the payers uh, probably six to nine months with some of them. And just similar to what Dave said, have dialogues, kind of explain to them Spark uh, gene therapy and then IRDs, and we didn't try to do that all at once. So there was multiple engagements, try to get them comfortable, uh, obviously, with each, each one of those facets. And to be able to get to a point where we can actually get the feedback that was relevant. Uh, that feedback was enormously important for us in order to kind of shape uh, the package that we needed or the set of solutions uh, that we needed to put forward. So I, I would recommend anybody that's thinking about launching, go early, uh, talk to them, absorb that feedback, and try to incorporate it. Uh, in, 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 in many ways. And as far as how that's transpired into uh, kind of uh, the HTAs and some of the discussions with ICER, I mean, really, for us, I think the way we looked at it was it was kind of the same set of things. Primarily, it was the first gene therapy that they evaluated. I'm talking about ICER. And then it was also the first IRD solution. And again, uh, we ended up going with a hybrid approach. We couldn't go fully collaborative because we were in the process of filing with the FDA, and there was a lot of data that was going back and forth, and we couldn't share all of it. But we, we felt like it was the responsible thing to do to assist them uh, in their evaluation to be able to get to a point where we're providing the feedback, whether it was on methodology or the uh, kind of the, the standards of care and what the, the natural history of the disease was, to be as informed as possible so they can make uh, the best judgment or the best determination uh, from their point of view. I don't think that holds true for all uh, gene, ther gene and cell therapy launches. I think you're going to have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it's largely going to be dependent on what are the set of dynamics that are involved and specifically the number of competitors, uh, what are the previous uh, kind of therapies that are on the market. So it's very much a wait and see until you kind of process all of those dynamics before you make a determination of how collaborative or not you're going to be in that process. So I think for us, uh, the le lessons from Luxterna have been largely positive. I think we felt like we got our, our, our message across to them and uh, you know, I, I, th I think it was a very collaborative approach. And then on your last question in terms of what's the biggest misconception, this is the one that constantly baffles me is just the, the hyper focus, and I get it, on the upfront price. Um, but I don't think people are really kind of tying the durability impact of some of these uh, medicines. And you know, we're out there, we're saying we'll stand behind that durability and we'll put outcomes contracts uh, forward to support it. But yet that message gets lost and it still comes back to kind of that upfront price. And I, don't, I think what they're missing is the tremendous um, cost savings that the healthcare industry can get from these new modalities. Because you're not going to charge every year for the lifetime of these products. It's just not practical. It's not going to happen. So therefore, there's going to be a more limited time than what you see with the current therapies. I'm talking about the chronic therapies. So to me, it's a little frustrating that the, that message is not getting across. And uh, hopefully, I'll, uh, me and the partners on this stage will do more to get that message out there. You think that, uh, I mean, there's so many aspects of this that will evolve over time, in particular with just more products approved and just more of these conversations where more companies are involved speaking with more payers. I mean, do you think that alone, that simple fact of more product approvals is going to help really facilitate that specific issue? I mean, it's sort of a, I'm with you, it's a little bit be bewildering that you can't kind of make that yeah. conversation go more smoothly, more quickly. But is it that, or is there something else you think I, might I happen? I think it will, Matt. I think because it's going to force them to think more long term about how to absorb the cost of some of these therapies. I think one or two on the market, it's not going to be an issue for them to be able to absorb the financial hit in a particular year, especially from that uh, upfront cost. But I think as more and more come to market and more and more available, I think they'll start to think about three and five year uh, horizons and how to spread the cost of some of these therapies over time. And I think that's what we, we, we all want, <laughs> which is, yeah. Uh, you know, you pay for the value, and if the value is there, you know, you get the benefit from that. Yeah, surely it's a combination, not just of the number of products approved, but also the sizes of those populations and, Correct. and how that changes the thinking. Uh, I want to move on to the next one, which is related, but I see you scribbling on your notepad over here. So being a good moderator that I am, <laughs> I'm trying to get you back for slightly embarrassing me earlier. Um, do you want to speak to that right now, or do you want to move I, on to the next I, I, All right, I, I just wrote that you're very handsome. That's what I wrote down. Is that why you were looking at my cheek, Mike? Uh, <laughs> Janet, we really got to think. Of, we really got to think about inviting this guy. Uh, <laughs> this is like three panels this year, and I think I'm kind of over it. Um, 
All right. Um, sorry. I'm no, kidding. So I, 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 I'm no, happy no. to. You don't have to. No. No, no, I'd like to. <laughs> um, and I won't read my notes here. Um, so I, well, I think one of the things that, um, that I think is important to, to hopefully hope for is that payers actually at some point in time will pair it back to us when more products are on the market. That, well, why not do this in a value-based model? I think that that's my next, that's my next section. <laughs> oh. you want, you wanna... You're good. I want you to go ahead. But... So, so I, 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 really, I really do believe that that's, that's out there. And I don't know if that's two, three, four, five years. And, and the only reason I say this, and it's unlimited experience, so just, just to be clear, is uh, in engaging in the, in the European community after an approval, the level of interest in value-based payments over time is exceptionally high. Um, almost universally, you get, yes, I think we should do this. Yes, I want to do it. And then you put the practical realities in front of, of them. And that's where it starts to break down. And it's a bit of a dust statement, I know. But that's where the persistence and the tenacity of companies like ours have to, have to come into play. Because there is the path of least resistance is the path that we're going to go down um, if we're not uh, persistent and continue to push the envelope. Because what we've seen in the early days is that you, the roadblocks come up. One day you think there is no way um, that this is going to get implemented. And a day later, it comes back that, oh, actually, there is a way. Because we challenged ourselves internally. And we can do it um, by changing this or that. And I know that's very generic, but it, we're seeing it out there um, in the early days of discussing our value-based model over time with outcomes measures and, and um, where we're taking risk. And there's great receptivity to it. That doesn't mean that we'll get everyone over the end line in a short period of time. It's going to take time and effort. But I, I do believe that it's out there. There's such interest in this, and there's so many therapies coming that I think there will be a day when they come back to us and say, why not try this? Which is a great start to this next topic. And so building on that a little bit, right? So one of the phrases uh, I've used and others have used is that we're uh, developing 21st century medicines in a 20th century system for payment in particular. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, we've been particularly interested to watch the work of, uh, of the companies in the space who have a product and are trying to be successful within the reality of the existing system. Um, and that's why it's been so great to have all, all of you on the panel. Um, I guess um, when you think more broadly, and, and I'm particularly passionate about this in particular and the concept that we need some fundamental syst systemic changes, including legislative changes that enables CMS uh, in particular to engage in payment over time systems. And it was really interesting. I think we all noticed, of course, the Senate Finance Committee draft legislation, which was controversial for a lot of reasons for a lot of folks. I understand that. But it did contain <coughs> the element establishing the potential for payment over time for gene therapy products. The definition was quite narrow, and that's another issue to work through, but fascinating and important and exciting, frankly, to me to see that in there as a recognition from elected officials that this is an important area, important to ensure patient access, and there's things we can do to improve that system. Uh, so that's probably one of the number one things, right, I think is on everyone's mind is, is this opportunity to facilitate payment over time. Each of your companies, and I'm sorry, Rochelle and BJ, this is a little bit the spark bluebird and uh, oh, don't worry. Vex's it's not show. Mind for us. But you're coming yeah. up next. Um, but each of you have tried to work creatively within the system. I mean, Jeff, your announcement was more European focused. Mm -hmm. The other guys are in the United States so far. Um, I'm curious to hear your take on um, how, how, you, how successful has it been to date in your opportunities. And Dave, is a little bit for you too, right? I mean, you guys announced. Uh, a creative approach to trying to offer payment over time. You talked about 2.1 million, and we've seen the headlines, but the reality is you are trying to make it available as a pay over time system. Um, and so I'd love to hear any additional thoughts on uh, those approaches. And then just big picture, your thoughts on uh, additional solutions maybe that might make sense to try to uh, improve the, the pace of patient access. Although, you know, Dave, I was encouraged to hear what you said about you know, having a pretty good success rate of getting patients onto treatment, but but surely, as we just talked about, as more products come to market, bigger opportunities, uh, bigger patient populations, the system itself is going to have to evolve. So that was not a very moderator-like thing. That sounded like a soapbox, but um, um, I don't know, Dave or Ron in particular, and, and come back to Jeff. Uh, what are your thoughts on that general issue? So maybe I can start. I think the um, 
listen, I think the, the, it's incumbent upon us to come at, with to payers flexibly about how we want to implement plans that are going to fit into whatever model that we're going uh, forward with. I think pay over time is an interesting one, um, but the reality is that we're still dealing with small populations, and so the tension for actual implementation isn't quite there yet. And so there's a lot of good discussion, um, but the reality is that at the end of the day, the payer says, well, it's only $2 million, and I only have three patients, so I'll just figure it out. Um, and that's a little bit the challenge we see. What, what I do see happening at a government and state level, though, is very interesting, some interesting dynamics. I think the federal government you know, understands there is an issue and wants to come out with a way to address it, either policy-wise or legislatively. And I think both are, are potential paths. I think it just takes the courage of one or other groups to really kind of put it forward. Um, I think where the pressure will come from is actually from the states. And so in discussions we've had with a lot of states, they're actually asking us to write in that we will allow them to pay over time if and when it's approved. Um, and so they're actually um, interested in advocating for it even though it's not technically available um, to them on a, on a government basis. I think on the commercial side, you know, most, most commercial payers can absorb the cost in the short term. And so while we offer that as a service um, that payers can take advantage of, no one actually has yet um, from what we've seen, um, at least within the US. Outside of the US, I think you have a different dynamic, which is you do have single payer systems that are budget based on, a, on an annual cycle. And there we actually see a lot more traction because they have a, a very um, pressing need to make sure that they don't blow up their budget on a very near term basis. Um, and so we already have some agreements that are getting very close to finalization with certain governments uh, to actually implement um, payment over time with them um, outside of the US because, they, because of the way their system operates on an annual basis. So I think the, the pressure has to be there to make it happen. I think it, it, it will happen. It just uh, may take a, a hemophilia drug or something bigger coming to the market to, to drive Have you that. seen any of those payers when they're talking to you about a contract for the long term sort of put in an option for them to switch to pay over time, but they don't want to do it in SMA, yeah, but they want they, to do it in something larger in the future or when they have their systems up and running or whatever. Yeah, I mean, they, they, that's a little bit the, what we see from the states, which is, okay, this is it for now, but if we, if we can and, and want to, we want to be able to do it, so um, that's there. Yeah, maybe I agree with everything that Dave said. Maybe I'll cover some of the other areas that we saw with Luxterna. One of the um, one of the big feedbacks from the payers initially was the the mark, the buy and bill model and the concerns that they were having in terms of uh, you know previous applications to gene therapy and the potential for abuse there or egregious kind of markups. And so what we tried to do is come forward uh, with solutions that would help address that. Um, what we found, what was a little surprising was there were some treatment centers that were very happy with those solutions because they were worried about cash flow management. And so uh, when you have five or six surgeries in a given month and you know, it takes 90 days, 120 days, 300 days to get coll you know, collection on these things, the administrative side of some of these treatment centers were largely like, we can't do the next surgery without getting confirmation on the previous surgery from this particular pair. And this is more of a concern primarily on the government side. Um, and so I think you know, having a solution that offers the direct ability for uh, the payer to pay for it, at least on the commercial side, has been uh, quite helpful. Again, I think we need some legislation to support some of those elements on the government side. Uh, but I think those things uh, are a you know, work in process and we'll get there. I think the other aspects around uh, kind of the the, the kind of the, the buy and bill is really around, or this, this trade off between direct versus buy and bill, is we were conscious that we needed to get the co pays for the patients to be somewhat reasonable in order to make sure that, you know, you've got this great product, but if the patients sure. can't be supported on that front, you're not going to get the, the treatments that you need. So, again, it was really a trade off between what, what we as the manufacturer wanted, what we felt was right for the patient what was right for the payer, and then also what was right for the institution. So the set of solutions that we put forward addressed a lot of that. So whether it was kind of the direct buy or the outcomes contracts that we put forward, uh, they have been largely uh, received favorably. I think the, the missing element is still the solution for addressing best price in AMP uh, to get to these installments, to get to better outcomes contracts with greater discounts. Uh, so again, uh, we're kind of all in it to figure out how to address that big gap that's still there. Yeah. Good, one, thanks. One thing I would just 
build on. You know, we were um, really concerned about the financial toxicity that could exist um, with early adoption and early use of the product. We've been very surprised at how willing institutions have been to take risks and actually go buy and build much more um, aggressively than we, we had anticipated. And I think that speaks to the sophistication that's happening in a lot of these accounts now about high price medications and the opportunity, the revenue opportunity that, that it could provide uh, for them. Um, so that's been an interesting development, I would say, and uh, something we spent a lot of time on, on the alternate ways and making sure that there wouldn't be that issue. Um, but we've actually seen a lot of institutions take the risks on their own, which has been pretty yeah, impressive. That's a really interesting trend. Can I oh. be a bad panelist and make a comment? Uh, you can, but we got to make sure we give VJ some time here on me. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, VJ. I just want to make a comment that you know it's it's, it's so not a one size fits all, yeah. and you know we've been watching all of you as we're preparing, and uh, and and it's a different set of solutions, you know, for us. And Absolutely. you know, we have um, obviously had discussions about payment over time, and we've been surprised that uh, so many of the payers aren't interested. Um, and they're more interested, we, as we we're talking about outcomes-based risk sharing in, in the early time period. Uh, so we're trying to chart a path forward for that, but then also we have the complication of inpatient. And so I think this carve-out issue for the inpatient um, is, is, a, is a big deal. And uh, that's, that's another piece that we need to solve. So I think just overall on this topic, it, it, it's so... You know, so we're all going to try different things, and we're all going to expand the universe of possibilities here. And I think it's not until we kind of get a, a set of a set of a toolbox uh, to work from that we're going to see real change. Yeah, no, fair point. And I don't mean to oversimplify by just talking about payment over time. There's some really unique uh, issues to be solved specific to hospital-administered cell-based therapies that also need to be solved. Uh, let's move to manufacturing and supply chain. CMC generally, uh, red hot topic in our community. It's hard to uh, see more than a month go by before seeing some piece of news in the industry about whether it's a, a delay related to manufacturing or a clinical hold because FDA has some questions or, or whatever it may be. Uh, it's an area of great, great complexity, in particular when we think about commercializing these products uh, globally. Uh, and so, uh, Vijay, you've been patiently sitting there, and I greatly appreciate your participation on the panel. Uh, to be clear, he said, don't, talk, don't ask me anything outside of the manufacturing and supply chain section. So, and we all said, don't ask I said, ask but I'm us. sure, Vijay, you have other things to say. And he said, yes, but the company has told me not to talk about those other things. So, anyway, sorry, I hope I didn't get you in trouble there. Um, so, Vijay, you're a veteran of the space. It's an, an incredible time in uh, the manufacturing supply chain conversation uh, at Kite slash Kite, a Gilead company. Uh, you're on the front lines of solving those challenges, and they've been very apparent, right, in the, in the initial years of commercialization of the lead uh, products, uh, yours and, and others. So I'd uh, love to hear about your sense of those challenges, uh, how you're trying to solve them, kind of maybe the biggest learning you guys have had over the last five years in particular? Yeah, the, before that, I want to make a comment on the value proposition, right? I mean, from a manufacturing side, definitely we talked about value, right? Uh, manufacturing definitely can contribute to that by bringing the cost of goods down. That's one way we can do that for the patients, and that's been the focus at Kite, too. I, in the other uh, section, I mean, I also was listening, yeah, there's the Efficacy uh, is pretty high, 60%. It's very promising. There are a lot of companies uh, being started now. But the most important thing we need to understand is from a patient perspective is the, especially in the autologous area, is the product available to them when they need it? That's the most important. And that's where the CMC kind of challenges start. And, and, and coming back to your question, yes, I mean, the autologous side, as Jeff was mentioning, it's very patient specific. And you know, going like coming from the patient, going back to the patient, there are lots of things that could go wrong. And one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in this industry, I've been in biotech uh, for 26 years now, but in uh, cell therapy, one thing that is very, very important and stressful is is the success rate. Uh, if if uh, you can't make a dose for a patient, that's the most difficult thing to absorb uh, for anybody. Kind of, it's it's simply. You have to overcome that uh, very in a different way. Uh, so, because there's no inventory, the patient is waiting, and especially they're at the end of their on all the, the treatments, they haven't worked. There's a lot of uh, hope and expectations. So, it, it's uh, it's a very st stressful thing for the industry in that sense. 
So starting with that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, at Kite over the last five years, you know, we've worked really hard on the manufacturing process and our success rate is in about 95%, uh, which is incredible, I mean, this field, especially when you're dealing with patients, individual patients, uh, one at a time. Uh, so that we need to continue to work on. That's the challenge that I would say, because we're not talking about 15,000 uh, 15, liter tanks and a lot of inventory while sitting in a warehouse. These are all small bags. And the most other important challenging aspect is uh, in the patient uh, cell therapies, is the quality of the product you get from the patient or the cells you get from the patient. You can't control it really well. I mean, you're dependent on it. And there's still, there's a lot of science happening to understand what are you getting from patients, but uh, we are still nowhere close to understanding the, everything. It depends on the age, condition of the patient, pretreatments, all those kinds of things. They contribute to the quality of the cells we receive, and that impacts the quality of the performance of the manufacturing process and the final product. So understanding all that um, takes time, and it's a constant learning for, for the industry in that sense. What about um, your sense of the engagement with the regulatory authorities um, in the last few years, right? This is an area of great interest. I'm guessing Peter Marks, when he speaks with us uh, later in the week, is going to highlight uh, CMC as an area of great passion uh, for them. Um, how, can you give us a sense for how that dialogue's gone, and is it uh, a good symbiotic relationship where you're sort of discussing and solving challenges along the way, or, or what's your sense of that environment? and, and uh, how challenging that is. So for Yes Carter right now, it's approved in US, EU, Canada, and uh, pretty soon in other countries too. So one thing we have seen in the last five years is uh, we were very happy with the collaboration received from all the regulatory agencies. Uh, in particular, FDA, because of the breakthrough designation, there was constant dialogue. It was very productive at every stage. Uh, each party, we understood uh, the challenges and what is best for the patient in this field, what is best for the manufacturing process in this field. So we have been very fascinated. I mean, again, uh, even not only uh, in US, but U Europe also, during the inspections, uh, they were open to understanding the constraints of this uh, field itself. The, the manufacturing processes are not uh, like traditional biotech. So it's, it's a constant learning for, the, I, I feel that it's a constant learning for the regulatory agencies too, and as, as we mature. Any uh, bold predictions for the future that you want to make about the Manufacturing and supply chain world, or there, uh, what do you see as advancements in the? In I think the five, the most, uh, I mean, probably a lot of people have heard about it. Most people talk about point of care. Uh, that we'll have to see. I mean, that's a great vision to have. To saying that you know, the manufacturing happens very close to the patient, not in a manufacturing site. But with all these uh, complexities associated with the understanding of the science itself, the manufacturing process, the regulatory uh, requirements quality constraints and all that, uh, we'll have to see how it gets uh, truly implemented in the future, if, if uh, that's the case. We're down to six minutes on the clock. Um, and uh, before I leave that topic, I just want to see if anyone else wants to chime in. Uh, everyone's living it and trying to solve it. Yep. I think the, the only thing from our side, because we're working on a tissue-based therapy, I think we're the rare of the rare. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and you know, maybe a plea for some innovation on analytical methods, which is really uh, difficult. I mean, we talk about the, the process as the product and, uh, you know, what, what happens when we want to change the process? And I think with traditional biologics manufacturing, you know the answer to that question. But we know of improvements we should and, and, and need to make if we want to reach all patients. To, to your point, that's the ambition here. And, uh, in order to do that, it seems you know not a clear path forward, and and that's really where we need to see some innovation in this area. I would say I would just add one thing, and that's the uh, and I'm sure you appreciate this living it every day. The quality systems mm -hmm. out there are still catching up. Um, I can't speak for obviously internal inside of companies because I suspect that inside of companies there's a there's a a focused effort to make sure the quality systems and the people and the, the trained people are, are there. But I think there is a dearth of quality people, at least in this field, obviously not for the, for the pharmaceutical industry as a whole. And I think more investment needs to go into well-trained uh, manufacturing uh, capable people in, in, in this field, in particular on the quality side of things. I mean, on the vendors and raw material supply side, definitely there needs to be uh, some level of maturity on that side too, because uh, this this industry is new. All the suppliers of raw material, biologics, and all, mm -hmm. 
and mostly either they are sole suppliers and they have their own challenges in getting the you know, uh, materials released. So that, that's one area too that has to mature. We're going to uh, wrap up with an exciting one. The topic <laughs> is called uh, media and politics. Ooh. Which, as you can all imagine, no panelist wanted any part of talking about. <laughs> I'm um, turning my mic off. But, I, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, as your uh, as your moderator, I felt remiss to not, uh, you know, raise it a little bit. We don't have to overdo it, and it is being recorded, so be careful. Um, obviously, significant interest in the space uh, from. Uh, an incredible number of parties, and we're definitely not lacking for news coverage uh, lately. I think we can all agree on that, including in the mainstream media. Um, and to state the obvious, there's uh, a important discussion going on uh, around uh, drug pricing in particular and healthcare broadly, uh, not just in Washington, but at state level and, of course, internationally as well. Um, it's a challenging environment to to discuss these complex issues, but it's uh, obviously extremely important subject matter, uh, in particular as we think about how to, again, ensure we're trying to create an environment where patients can get access to these medicines. And so, uh, to the degree you have the courage, I'd appreciate hearing any big picture uh, thoughts on that environment and the steps you or your company uh, are taking or that you would like to see ARM take as we try to do uh, to try to ensure a thoughtful and, and constructive dialogue, I suppose. I'll, t I'll take, I'll take a crack. It? Yeah, I will. I, I, it's, um, and this shouldn't be controversial at all, <laughs> which is it, it really ultimately a story has to continue to be about the patients and the value and the lives, unfortunately, that they are subject to, not to, uh, you know, obviously not for, for their fault, um, the trials and tribulations of the family that surround them, and the value of these therapies, all of these therapies in terms of changing lives uh, for the better. And there are more stories coming out about that. I don't think enough, and I think that's where ARM certainly can play a role um, on the education side of really understanding the value of this industry, uh, both with regard to uh, targeting uh, the general public, as well as the media themselves, um, because I think it, it, it does get lost when you start talking about a single price, as opposed to the experience of these patients before and after therapy, and the value of that holistically, not just in cost savings, not just in um, uh, other aspects of, of the value proposition, quality of life, et cetera, but also the impact on families, because some of these therapies have such a dramatic impact on the lives of these families, and even their, on their productiv productivity in society. And we can't lose sight of that. I know that uh, a lot of the conversations tend to shift. We have to constantly shift it back, I think, to, to the value of, of these therapies and the impact on lives. And I know that's a very simple statement, but I think we just need to do more and more and more of that. And we've got the substrate here. We've got the ability to, to tell these stories in a pretty, pretty uh, profound way. Yeah, and that's uh, just building on that a little bit. Um, it's, to me, it's all about education, engaging in the conversation and education to ensure uh, all these different constituents understand, in particular, what's novel and unique uh, about our approach to uh, these medicines, what these medicines can do, and the impact it's having on, on patients. And although it's obviously a mandate of ARM, it's, it's part of our, our passion and our goals, uh, it needs to be. Uh, the same at each company involved, mm -hmm. and I said the same thing at, at uh, the beginning of the year, but it needs to involve every one of you. Right? You're here because you're interested in some way in this field, and so the responsibility to have that conversation and educate uh, people about the field and its importance is something that I hope everyone uh, will embrace, whether you're talking to you know, uh, your uncle uh, or um, you know, an elected official. So I uh, appreciate that you, you take on that challenge. And with that, it's five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Thank you to my panelists, and thank you all of you for a, a reception. Thank you.